Good evening, and welcome to the League of Women Voters Candidate Forum for the Democratic candidates running for the 11th Congressional District. This event is being recorded. I am Susan Craighead, President of the League of Women Voters of Naperville. The League is a nonpartisan organization. We do not support or oppose candidates for public office. You can rely on the League to present fair and civil candidate events where each candidate is allowed an equal chance to respond. Primary election day 2024 is March 19th and early voting has already begun. Now is the time to make your plan for how you will cast your ballot. We hope that part of your plan is to educate yourself on the candidates and issues in order to confidently vote the whole ballot. In addition to watching candidate events live or recorded, you may also find candidate information on vote411.org, our nonpartisan online voter guide. All candidates have been invited to respond to questions and their answers appear complete and unedited. A video of this candidate forum will be linked to Vote 411. And now let me introduce Barb Lyman, our moderator for tonight. Thank you, Susan. Welcome to the Candidate Forum for Democratic 11th Congressional District of Illinois, sponsored by the League of Women Voters of Naperville with support from the Leagues of Women Voters of the Aurora area and Downers Grove, Woodridge, Lyle. As Susan said, my name is Barb Lymans, a member of the League of Women Voters of Wheaton and your moderator for this evening. I live in West Chicago, so I will not be voting for any of the candidates participating in the forums this evening. The League of Women Voters is a nonpartisan organization that neither supports nor opposes candidates or parties for office. The League is not affiliated with any political party. The League's purpose is to promote civic responsibility through the informed and active participation of citizens in government and civil civic discourse. Providing opportunities to meet candidates is a major mission of the League of Women Voters so voters can be become better informed about the issues facing their community and to become better acquainted with the candidates running for office. I would now like to invite the candidates to turn on their videos. Participating in tonight's forum are the Democratic candidates for the Illinois 11th Congressional District, candidate Bill Foster and candidate Qasim Rashid. The format for tonight night is a forum, not a debate. Candidates are expected to accurately represent the facts and their responses reflect their own views and opinions. The League of Women Voters is not responsible for the accuracy of statements made by the candidates. It is the responsibility of the public, news media, and opposing candidates to fact check statements made by candidates if necessary. The candidates have agreed to abide by the rules set forth prior to this forum. All candidates attending tonight have signed and returned the ground rules by the deadline established in the invitation. These rules specify the format, time limits, broadcasting of the forum, and other rules related to the conduct of the forum. The candidates will begin in alphabetical order with their two-minute opening statements. They will then alternate the order in which they answer questions for two minutes. After the question portion of the forum, each candidate will give a two-minute closing statement continuing our alternating pattern. A member of the league will be acting as timer and I will enforce the time limits. Candidates, you will see a slide to let you know that you have one minute, 30 seconds, 15 seconds, and then stop. Should a candidate exceed the time limit, I will ask them to finish their sentence and move on to the next candidate. To ensure that the questions for tonight's forum represents a balance of topics, a panel of experienced members of the League of Women Voters has reviewed the questions submitted for appropriateness and to avoid duplication. Finally, I want to say how appreciative we are of the candidates who are not only willing to serve in office, but who have agreed to be here tonight to share their ideas and goals. So let us get started. Candidate Foster, you have two minutes for your opening statement. Well, thank you, Barb, and uh, thank you to the League of Women Voters. And uh, thank you also for your tolerance of all of the uncertainty in our congressional voting schedule tonight. You know, tonight we just finished swearing in Tom Suozzi, who's the Democrat replacing George Santos. 
and I guess a reminder to all of us of the importance of running the right candidate in a seat that some might have thought was a safe blue seat. So I'm Congressman Bill Foster. I'm a scientist and a businessman. As a scientist, I worked at Fermi National Accelerator Lab for 23 years and raised my family in the Fox Valley. As a businessman, when I was 19, I started a business in our basement with my younger brother. And I'm proud that that company now provides over a thousand jobs, good manufacturing jobs with good pay and good benefits. And I'm proud that we kept those good manufacturing jobs here in the Midwest. As the only PhD physicist in Congress, I bring with me a respect for scientific truth, facts, and logic that is rather rare in a Congress that seems dominated by fast-talking lawyers. The American people are facing a lot of challenges right now, from white right-wing assault on reproductive freedom, to gun violence, to the challenges posed by advances in artificial intelligence, the need to protect our climate from future generations, and the ever-present threat of nuclear proliferation. To tackle those issues, we need serious leaders who understand the technology and lead with the science and a deep understanding of the policies that we debate in Washington. And I'm proud at how my office has served my constituents. This past year, I was able to help marshal all levels of government, federal, state, and local to bring, and even bring in the White House to help the UAW save the Belvedere assembly plant and to make sure the workers who were displaced were able to return to the work and, and that they were proud to work at for generations. And in the past year, our office helped return over $800,000 of money that my constituents were owed by the federal government, secured federal money for federal projects from homeless shelters to technical systems for our first responders to pedestrian bridges across the Fox River. Thank you. Thank you. Candidate Rashid, you have two minutes for your opening statement. Uh, thank you to the League of Women Voters. Thank you to all who are attending. And thank you to my colleague, Bill Foster, for attending this. Uh, my name is Qasim Rashid. I am a Democrat and human rights lawyer. Uh, I'm an immigrant from Pakistan, raised right here in Illinois and in DuPage County. Um, my parents are teachers. And after we immigrated, they ingrained in us the beauty of this country to be engaged. And, and part of that was the immigrant struggle. Uh, we, you know, spent the majority of our 90s in Section 8 housing, living off food stamps. I've been working since I was 15 years old, and it taught me the struggles that so many working families are going through even to this day. Uh, after finishing up in public school, attending North Central College for two years right in Naperville, and then finishing up at UIC, my wife Aisha encouraged me to go to law school. And in law school is where I found my love of human rights law. And while I did spend about three or four years uh, enforcing Dodd-Frank bank regulations to ensure that consumers weren't exploited, um, I spent the majority of my career working on human rights law, supporting survivors of domestic and sexual violence, expanding healthcare and education access, treating the climate crisis with the urgency that it deserves for bold action, not incremental change. Now, as I run for U.S. Congress, I run on those same values because we live at a time where while we grew up food insecure, uh, food insecurity is worse now than it was back then. I remember Al Gore warning of the impending climate crisis, and now we see how horrific it's become, made in part by politicians who take fossil fuel money against the science. Healthcare has become extraordinarily unaffordable, and we need guaranteed universal healthcare, especially if we're serious about protecting abortion and reproductive health access. I'm proud to run a campaign that is exclusively and the only one that is 100% funded by we the people, because I believe that the people we send to Congress should reflect the will of the people. What was once a deep red district is now a solid blue, deep blue district, and I'm excited to make my case to earn your support and win this election on March 19th and on November 5th. Thank you. Thank you. The first question will start with you, candidate Rashid. Yes. What is a legislator's responsibility to ensure a healthy democracy rooted in our constitution? Well, you know, our founding documents begin with the words, we the people. And that to me speaks to the responsibility of every elected official to ensure that every decision we're making is accountable to the people. And look, there's a reason why, despite how divided our nation is, 95% of Americans agree that we need to get corporate money out of politics. They don't trust politicians who give them lip service about voting to take corporate money out of politics, but then accept millions in corporate donations. One of the fundamental broken parts of our democracy today is that uh, dark money interests, 
corporations will spend absurd amounts of money, tens of millions, if not billions of dollars to lobby politicians, to vote for corporate interests, uh, vote for uh, dark interests, as opposed to protecting the interests of the people. And we've seen this happen time and time again. We've seen politicians vote for the ACA, take tons of money from health insurance companies, and then vote to repeal the ACA. Vote for bank regulation, take tons of uh, banking money, and then vote to deregulate banks. Vote for climate justice, take Exxon and oil money, and then vote for drilling and promote fracking as environmentally beneficial. The responsibility of a public servant is to ensure that their every vote is exclusively accountable to we, the people. And this transcends uh, issues that, uh, that, that uh, politicians may disagree upon. For example, Democrats are pretty united that we need to uh, work on gun safety regulation. But we know the role that the NRA plays in influencing Republicans to vote against gun safety regulations. That's why, in my view, to protect democracy, we can't just talk about getting corporate money out of politics. We need to elect public servants who are uh, about action because actions speak louder than words. Once we can ensure that only people are represented in the halls of Congress, that's how we ensure that the will of the people becomes the law of the land. That's how we protect voting rights, abortion rights, and, uh, and, and uh, pass universal health care and take the climate crisis seriously. Thank you. Candidate Foster, the same question. What is a legislator's responsibility to ensure a healthy democracy rooted in our constitution? Well, the biggest threat to our democracy is the loss of faith in free and fair elections. Uh, people must be able to exercise their right to vote and know that their vote will be counted and that the outcome of the election will be respected. There's nothing more important to our democracy than protecting the right to vote. So I'm proud that while states across the country are trying to make it harder to vote, Illinois is leading by example, passing measures to protect voting rights and make it easier for citizens to cast their vote. And this includes things like same day registration, early voting and mail-in voting. I was proud to vote for the John Lewis Voting Rights Act, which would restore protections for Voting Rights Act and strengthen the ability for the federal government to intervene in the instances of voter discrimination and disenfranchisement. What occurred on the Capitol in January 6, 2021, was an attack on our democracy and a cherished tradition of the peaceful transfer of power. It was an attempt by a mob to overturn a democratic election done while President Trump refused to do anything to stop it. And this is why we need to stand united as a democratic party uh, to stand up for our constitution and our democracy, because we are the only ones standing between Trump and the White House. Thank you. Candidate Foster, the next question. How does membership in NATO impact our domestic and international security? Well, NATO, you know, for ever since World War II, NATO has been a treaty level obligation of the free democracies of Western Europe and, and the United States and Canada uh, to have each other's backs um, when we, if we were attacked. And uh, that was a very serious and very important commitment that we had. And it's under uh, assault in many directions, uh, primarily, frankly, from inside, from uh, President Trump's uh, ambivalence about whether or not we should obey that treaty level commitment. You know, and the issue really now is focused on Ukraine. Um, I have a special, as a physicist, uh, I have a special uh, attitude toward toward the situation in Ukraine. Ukraine gave up its nuclear weapons at the end of the Cold War in return for a promise from the free world of their territorial integrity. And if we decide to walk away from that commitment as Republicans today, tonight in, in Washington are walking away from that commitment, it sends a very, very dangerous message to any country that's thinking of becoming a nuclear proliferator that you better have your nuclear weapons and you better keep them. And that is probably the, the single largest threat that we, long-term threat that we face as a democracy and as a world. Candidate Rashid, how does membership in NATO impact our domestic and international security? Well, I think this is an example of the importance of having uh, more international human rights lawyers in the halls of Congress. Because at the end of the day, the purpose of NATO 
is not just an alliance. That's a key component of it, but it's also to prevent conflict. And we prevent conflict by engaging in diplomacy, by engaging in dialogue. Uh, part of the fundamental uh, uh, missing aspect of the last 20, 25 years is the lack of uh, effective leadership who will uh, call out injustices in international human rights law, resulting in ongoing global conflicts. Uh, we've seen this since the 1990s, at least, with the perpetual never-ending wars that have uh, kind of ravaged our nation, cost us trillions of dollars, have not made us any safer. And even now, we see a continued push towards more, bo more bombing, refusals to engage in ceasefires, refusals to recognize the humanitarian cost and conflict. This is not how we create safe, uh, safety in a long-term basis. Part of the whole purpose of the creation of NATO was to have an alliance of countries that uphold democracy, that uphold the humanity of one another. Uh, as, as an American citizen, as somebody who was raised here, who studied our history, uh, we should all be concerned that for more than 90% of America's existence, we've been in some kind of a war. And, uh, and in my view, for us to turn the tide on this and create a future with new leadership who are committed to true economic, social, and climate justice, it requires that we come to the table, we work not just with our allies to stop war that's happening, but to engage meaningfully and effectively to prevent further conflict from happening. That's how we strengthen NATO. That's how we strengthen our allies. That's how we ensure democracy is lived by example, by values, by humanity, and not necessarily by force or war. Thank you. Candidate Rashid, the next question is this. What proposals do you have to address the increasing cost of living? I, I'm so grateful for this question. You know, I still remember being 15 years old, working at Dominic's until midnight, walking home by the side of the highway because we only had one car and no one was going to pick me up at midnight and recognizing the, the vast wealth and income inequality that we suffer in this country. And even right now, wealth and income inequality is by some measures worse than it was after the Great Depression. It continues to get worse. And one of the reasons why it gets worse is because multimillionaire politicians are more worried about their campaign donations from corporations who are exploiting workers. We have major corporations like Amazon who are one of the biggest violators of basic workplace ethics exploiting their workers, and then contributing to politicians to look the other way. And despite the overall decrease in inflation, we still see a massive increase in the price of groceries, the massive increase in the, uh, in the cost of basic living. You talk to our Latino constituents right here in the 11th district, and they are spending 24% of their income on transportation costs. You look at the spike in housing and you see it's, it's in part due to the National Association of Realtors exploiting sellers and, and buyers to the tune of $70 billion and our House Financial Services Oversight Committee doing nothing to hold them accountable. So again, I go back to electing people who have the lived experience of what it's like to suffer in poverty, electing people who are 100% accountable to we the people, not accountable to corporations, and then working on true economic justice. And that means ensuring that multimillionaires and billionaires are paying their fair share in taxes. We are lowering taxes on working people and on small businesses. And for me, this is also an issue of guaranteeing universal health care. Every study shows that not only will it lower our costs overall, but it makes small businesses more affordable to run because now you have less overhead costs. These are all practical solutions that put more money in the hands of people who need it and holds our wealthier more accountable. Thank you. Candidate Foster, what proposals do you have to address the increasing cost of living? Yeah, well, the first thing is to make sure that we continue the recovery of the U.S. economy since COVID. Uh, since President Biden took office, nearly 15 million jobs have been created, by far a record. Inflation um, is now around 3%, which is down significantly from the 9% late in the COVID pandemic, and it's continuing to fall. And there's a lot more to be done. When the inflation was at its peak, I supported policies like the lower fuel and food and fuel cost act, uh, which to shore up supply chain issues that were causing goods to become so expensive. During that time, we passed historic legislation to negotiate drug prices with pharmaceutical companies and to cap out-of-pocket costs for seniors at $2,000 a year. 
this will be transformative uh, to, the, to the household budgets of millions of seniors. And despite the falling, the falling inflation, families are still feeling the pain from the rapidly rising costs. I believe the best way to address this is by raising workers' wages and helping low and middle income families afford life's essential. This is why I am proud to support the Protecting Right to Work to Organize Act that will ensure that every worker has the right to form a union to raise and the Raise the Wage Act to gradually raise the minimum wage and get the lower minimum and get rid of the lower minimum wages for tipped workers and people with disabilities. The research is absolutely clear that increased unionization and higher minimum wages raise wages for everybody, unionized or not, and minimum wage or not. And to help families afford essential goods and services, I also supported policies like the child tax credit expansion, the subsidized the affordable child care costs, expand SNAP benefits to make them more flexible, build more affordable housing, and bring down the cost of college student loans. To strengthen the ACA and make healthcare more affordable, and especially prescription drugs, among many other policies. Thank you. The next question will deal with healthcare. Um, Candidate Foster, what changes, if any, would you like to see in the existing healthcare system? Well, I have always believed in universal health care and believed that the most important, the most effective pathway is the incremental pathway that we began with the Affordable Care Act. At that time, the emergency was getting rid of the scourge of people who had pre-existing conditions and could get no health care coverage at all. Um, I started my political career by flipping Speaker Dennis Hastert's seat blue, and after I won, I was not afraid to cast the tough votes to rescue our economy, to reform Wall Street, and for the Affordable Care Act. And I did so knowing that my vote for the Affordable Care Act could cost me my seat, and it did cost me my seat in 2010. But because of that vote, almost 21 million people have access to health care today that they would not otherwise have had. But I did not stop there. I went back to Congress in 2012 by flipping another red seat blue. And since then, I have voted time and again to make health care more accessible and more affordable. And that's why I supported the American Rescue Plan, which improved and expanded ACA subsidies, which should be ex expanded further but so that more people can afford health insurance. It's why I supported and I voted for the Inflation Reduction Act, which for the first time in history allows Medicare to negotiate drug prices caps insulin at $35 a month, and caps drug costs for seniors at $2,000 a month. These policies should be expanded um, to provide even more benefits. But that progress only happens if you have candidates who are capable of winning the tough seats and taking the tough votes to make them this happen. Thank you. Candidate Rashid, the same question to you. What changes, if any, would you like to see in the existing health care system? You know, this is very personal to me. Uh, my wife, Aisha, and I have three amazing kids. Our youngest daughter, Hannah Noor, has an incurable autoimmune disease. And this incremental strategy through the ACA has resulted in us being denied our health care claims. Her medical bills are a quarter million dollars a year. And the insurance company said, nope, we're not going to cover it because it's not financially feasible for us to do so. This is cruelty because my daughter is one of millions who are suffering through these exact same things. We need a guaranteed universal health care model because that is a proven model. 30 plus developed nations have this model. And what it shows us, what the data and facts tell us, is that a universal health care model that prioritizes health care, not profits, is one in which we are spending, we would spend half per capita of what we're spending right now because every developed nation in the world that has a guaranteed healthcare model is spending half per capita of what Americans are spending. They all have longer life expectancies. They have lower maternal mortalities. They have lower infant mortalities. And they have abortion and reproductive health access to all people who need it, not just those who are on the healthcare system here in the United States. And the beauty of this model, by the way, in the United States is that between Medicare, Medicaid, and TRICARE, what, what military veterans use, Nearly half the country is already on a universal health care system. In fact, Kaiser Family Foundation, a nonprofit, nonpartisan healthcare media company, did a deep study on this and found that a uh, this current for-profit system costs an average family of four up to 30%. But a universal healthcare system would cost about 
9%. It is time we get past this corporate corruption of the healthcare industry, which is causing innocent people to die. And it's time to look at this from a humane perspective, take bold progressive change, catch up with the rest of the world. We're Americans. We can do everything we put our minds to and guarantee healthcare as a human right, not just through lip service, but by passing the proven legislation that we know will work. Thank you. Candidate Rashid. Yes. What should the federal government's role be, if any, in addressing women's reproductive rights? You know, uh, I serve as the executive director of a nonprofit uh, that works specifically on expanding abortion and reproductive health access. And this is work that I've done throughout my entire career as a human rights lawyer to protect abortion access and reproductive health access. And this is fundamentally why we need guaranteed universal health care on a federal level, because even with the current ACA model, women like Kate Cox, who have health insurance but are in a red state, have no access to abortion or reproductive health care. And this is not a political uh, attack. This is life and death for millions of women. The studies show, the CDC reports show, that the top 17 states that have the highest maternal mortality rates are red states that refuse to provide abortion and reproductive health care access. And the top 10 states with the lowest maternal mortality rates are blue states that guarantee abortion and reproductive health care. The fact that politicians want to make this a for-profit enterprise to me is deeply concerning. And it makes me question whether they truly value the importance of providing health care as a human right. The federal government's role should be to recognize that health care is a human right and ensure that we are passing legislation that will provide guaranteed universal health care to all people to ensure that women have access to abortion and reproductive health care when and how they choose it in consultation with their physicians. What happened in Alabama with this ban on IVF is truly an atrocity. And I commend Senator Duckworth for trying to pass a resolution, a bill in the Senate to prove the hypocrisy of Republicans. We cannot negotiate with people who are anti-science and committing legislative medical malpractice. The role of the federal government, of federal legislators, is to reject uh, corporate funding from these healthcare industries, to demand healthcare as a human right, and to show, not just by our lip service, but by our actions, we champion abortion care and reproductive health care for all people in this country, because that's how we form a healthier family and a healthier future for all people. Candidate Foster, the same question to you. What should the federal government's role be, if any, in addressing reproductive women's reproductive rights? Well, first, the Supreme Court's decision to overturn Roe versus Wade was the culmination of decades of deliberate effort by extreme Republicans to take away reproductive rights and control the health care decisions of women. Uh, since the Dobbs decision, far-right politicians have used it to restrict reproductive rights of all kinds in states across this country. You know, this has long been an issue with me. I stood by Planned Parenthood in Aurora when their Aurora office was firebombed in 2015. And ensuring that women in every state have access to reproductive health care, including safe abortion care, is one of my top priorities in Congress. I have long supported and have voted for the Women's Health Protection Act which would restore rights that were taken away by the Dobbs decision and enshrine them permanently into federal law. I am a co-sponsor also of the EACH Act, which requires all health insurance plans to cover abortion care. And I'm also a supporter of the Ensuring Women's Right to Reproductive Freedom Act, which protects women's right to travel across state lines to get an abortion. Access to birth control is as important as access to abortion. And we are seeing the next steps play out right now in Alabama and elsewhere, where IVF is on pause or under threat because of the Supreme Court's ruling. So as long as I have a vote in Congress, I will continue to fight against extreme Republicans encroaching on women's reproductive rights. But you only make progress on this issue if you can win elections against MAGA Republicans. And my record speaks for itself. I have a 100% pro-choice lifetime voting record, and that is why I am the only candidate in this race endorsed by Planned Parenthood Action Fund. Thank you. Candidate Foster, switching gears a little bit, what measures, if any, are needed to regulate social media platforms? Well, I think that the um, this is the leading edge of a, a bunch of issues that we're seeing having to do with the onslaught of artificial intelligence. 
Um, I've been engaged in artificial intelligence. Well, I first encountered it back in the 1990s when we were using neural networks to classify particle physics interactions. So I've watched the exponential growth of this technology. And I think when the history of our time is written, the 2016 election of Trump will be the first time that we saw these, uh, these artificial intelligence algorithms manipulating people consciously or not and uh, affecting the results of, of our dem democracy. And so this is one of the reasons why I'm so proud to have been uh, appointed recently the, um, to the AI task force that Hakeem Jeffries and, and Speaker Johnson appointed me to. You know, they understand that if we're going to um, get control of our cell phones, of our, our social, of the echo chamber of social media, that we have to start with an understanding of the underlying technology and, and, uh, and understand the scientific data that's becoming blindingly clear that our children are being damaged badly by excessive exposure to cell phones and social media. Candidate Rashid, what measures, if any, do you feel are needed to regulate social media platforms? You know, as a as a father, as a parent, this is very near and dear to my heart for a number of reasons. One, I have three young children and recognizing the many harms of social media and balancing that out with the many benefits is a key component of what many parents are struggling through. Um, part of the problem, again, is that we don't have effective legislators in Congress who understand this threat. Um, we witnessed uh, in our lifetimes the Rohingya genocide um, committed uh, on Facebook. Uh, we've witnessed the, the, the mass manipulation of, of young teens and the higher rates of depression and even suicide uh, due to these algorithms. And, and rather than talk about theoretical aspects of it, I want to talk about the, about the ground reality. Uh, I personally um, am subject as someone who was threatened on social media, on Twitter, to be killed for my faith. I did everything right. I reported it. I let them know. And the, the, the Twitter said, no, this is not a problem. It ended up being a violation of federal law. I was fortunate as a human rights attorney who understands rights on how to defend and protect myself. And we were able to prosecute this person in civil court and criminal court. But not everybody is that fortunate. We need to ensure that our laws are reflective of not only ensuring free speech and free access, but not letting that line cross into incitement to violence, to terrorism, to dehumanization, which is something that's happening all too often. This is an area that I've worked in, not just from the perspective of an attorney, but something I experience every day as a parent. And I think the role of the federal government is to partner with the experts in this space. And there are many experts who have combated this issue successfully and implement those strategies so that our children can be safe, our online platforms can be effective and productive, and we can also protect democracy. But that only happens if we elect leaders funded by people, not by the same corporations who are causing the problem in the first place. You did it, Rashid. This next question will begin with you. Yeah. Do you support aid for Ukraine, Israel, and or the Palestinian people? Why or why not? Again, this is an issue where we need to be very clear about the importance of having leaders at the table who will uphold international human rights law on a consistent basis. Uh, the aid to Ukraine is a critical component of maintaining peace. You know, Ukraine gave up their nuclear weapons uh, in part, in significant part, because we committed to support them should they face Russian aggression. As someone who has been endorsed by Peace Action, the nation's largest anti-nuclear organization, I am proud of our actions to support Ukraine. Uh, and I'm the only candidate endorsed uh, by this anti-nuclear uh, proliferation organization. Uh, additionally, look, Israel is an ally. And what a good friend does to their ally is we work with them, but then when they violate international human rights law, we hold them accountable. Um, we have the Leahy laws, which forbid the Department of Defense uh, and the State Department from giving weapons to nations when we know are committing human rights violations. Uh, the ICJ ruling has been clear that Israel is committing human rights violations and they need to curb their bombing. But the fact that politicians continue to support more and more aid when more than 30,000 innocent civilians have been killed, more than 70% of them women and children, 
is deeply concerning and shows why we need more human rights lawyers in Congress who will actually uphold the law. And same with the Palestinian people. We need to provide aid to the Palestinian people. The way to peace here is through diplomacy. Even during this horrific siege in Gaza, two hostages were released during bombing, but 136 were released during a ceasefire. We need to ensure we're protecting Israel and Palestine, and we do that by upholding international human rights law, demanding a ceasefire, an unconditional release of all hostages and Palestinian pr prisoners, an end to the occupation and an end to the settlements. I'm the only candidate calling for that because I'm the only candidate adamant that we must uphold international human rights law in the short term and the long term. Thank you. Candidate Foster, do you support aid for UK, Ukraine, Israel, and or the Palestinian people? Why or why not? Yeah, in, in terms of Gaza, first, I believe that Israel has the right to exist and a right to defend itself. But I have been deeply disappointed with Netanyahu's conduct of the war and conduct in many areas for years. I have um, supported humanitarian ceasefires from the very start of this conflict. These are the ceasefires that allowed the hostages to be released and the civilian populations to be separated from the areas of combat. This must be continued. And I have voted against military assistance packages for Israel that were not accompanied by humanitarian aid to Gaza. This is a multi-generational tragedy that is not going to be fixed quickly. As a longtime supporter of the two-state solution, I also support the Biden administration's insistence that the two-state solution be included in any resolution to this conflict. But as I mentioned before, Ukraine is also very important to me. Um, you know, as a as a physicist, um, you know, there's something that you can do if you're a physicist, which is you can visit the the weapons labs where they take you into the room where you see our nuclear weapons taken apart, and you see the technical aspects and the capabilities of our enemies' weapons. And if you do not take your job seriously after that, you're not thinking clearly. Uh, and so I have worked in many ways with legislation too long to cite here. Uh, that is that is step by step doing everything we can to reduce the risk of nuclear war and not setting a bad example on refusing to de defend Ukraine is important. As a member of the Financial Services Committee, there's also a key element that we are working hard to make a reality. And this is the taking the $300 billion of frozen uh, Russian currency reserves at Western banks and diverting it to assistance to rebuild Ukraine. And I'm very proud that the that the Biden administration is taking leadership on making this happen. Thank you. The next question, Candidate Foster, is this. What are your priorities for immigration reform? Well, um, you know, I have been a strong supporter of comprehensive immigration reform as long as I've been in Congress. You know, one of my proudest votes in Congress was my vote for the DREAM Act. Uh, in the, in the old 14th district when I was a new member of Congress and, and a district that was, that was not a very popular stand. Um, and we must pass the Dream and, Prom and Promise Act, this, the current version of these, which I voted for, to allow undocumented immigrants uh, brought into the US as children to gain a path to citizenship. Uh, to make progress on this issue, we must first win back control of Congress. And the first step there is to hold onto the seats we have uh, that's been my career. The votes, the votes in favor of immigration reform, uh, would not have happened if I had not been able to do, to take Dennis Hastert's seat, to defeat Judy Biggert and the MAGA Republicans that, that have been running against me. And hope for bipartisan, comprehensive immigration reform has not died. Uh, there are elements of that in the in the compromise that was hammered out uh, dealing with the border in the Senate. That is far from a perfect bill, but it is a start for the, the bipartisan compromise that we're going to need to make uh, to solve this problem once and for all. I've also done things in, in the high skill immigration uh, area. I've written and introduced what's called the Keep STEM Talent Act that would allow students who earn STEM graduate degrees here to stay here and contribute to our economy. And finally, we must uh, provide more resources to our immigration court system. So we get rid of the, the terrible backlog over two years for asylum seekers so that they have a quick uh, adjudication of, of their status and they can get on with their lives, whether or not their asylum uh, you know, qualifies in the end. Candidate Rashid. 
What are your priorities for immigration reform? You know, as an immigrant myself and seeing the very unjust immigration system that we have, I've experienced this myself and I've processed dozens of asylum claims from uh, from Syria, from Afghanistan, from Honduras, from, from Ukraine. And so I've seen this very unjust system um, uh, up close and personal. You know, a, a few, uh, about a week ago, I was at Matea Valley High School speaking to young high school students. And this bright young kid comes up to me and says, you know, Mr. Rashid, uh, I'm an immigrant. We've been here a decade now and we still don't have our green card and we don't know what the future holds. What are we gonna do to solve this problem? And so for me, I see this as a three part solution. One, again, we need to uphold international human rights law. We can't be selective with asylum. And, and I'm gonna be critical of President Trump and President Biden because my job is to uphold justice. President Trump did something extraordinarily cruel when he suspended asylum under Title 42 or decreased it significantly. And I commended President Biden when he ran for president for saying that that's cruel and we will not do that. Well, President Biden is now following down that same path, and I'm the only one being consistent in calling him out because that is unjust. We need to protect asylum as a human right. So the, the reason that, that it's so backed up because, is because we have not invested effectively enough in immigration judges, attorneys, and USCIS. So one, we need to make significant investments there. Two, we need to recognize the massive economic opportunity we have with immigrants. Recent report just came out that even undocumented immigrants have added $7 trillion to our economy. We have four and a half million migrant worker jobs that can be filled by these workers with an effective economic worker visa program. This will cut down on trafficking, cut down on exploitation and abuse and lower costs for all of us. And then finally, we need a meaningful pathway to citizenship for DACA and Dreamers. This is common sense to me. This is com These are our neighbors. They're our family members. There is no reason to leave them in limbo. We can build a more cohesive immigration policy that strengthens our border, is humane, and strengthens our economy. We're going to switch gears a little bit here and talk about the economy and the environment. So, Candidate Rashid. What do you see as the federal government's role in mitigating the impact of climate change? Well, I have always seen climate change or climate justice as a three-part strategy of economic, social, and climate justice. The first role of the federal government is to be accountable to we the people. I'm proudly endorsed by Gen Z for Change, the largest youth climate movement in the history of the country. Uh, I'm proudly uh, endorsed by Global Youth for Climate Justice, another climate justice organization. So the youth leaders on climate change recognize my candidacy and have gotten behind me full-fledged. I'm proud of that. I'm also proud that I'm leading by example. I'm not taking Exxon money. I'm not promoting fracking or carbon capture or, or voting uh, for offshore drilling. These are all anti-science, anti-climate policies. On the contrary, I have been a strong proponent of massive federal investment of transition to green energy. Because look, you can't just go to somebody working in the fossil fuel industry and say, hey, your job is canceled, go figure something else out. We need to have an off-ramp and we need to make massive federal investments. And we do that, one, by looking at history and two, by following the science. We look at history by recognizing that it was massive federal investment investments that helped us electrify America, built our highway system, built our railway system. And even now, I commend President Biden for uh, establishing national broadband that by 2030, we'll all have national broadband. This is federal investments. We need to do the same thing with climate justice by investing in green energy. And then two, we look at the actual scientists. Climate, uh, science. climate scientists are telling us that we need a 2030 carbon neutral economy. In fact, at a recent forum, uh, Sean Kasten, an actual climate scientist, said even th that's too late. We need to be as soon as possible. I'm the only one demanding a 2030 carbon neutral economy. We can't wait till 2050. That's way too late. We all remember last summer when the skies were orange due to the Canadian wildfires. The federal government has a precious opportunity to make these investments, but that happens by electing people funded by people, not by big oil. Candidate it Foster? What do you see as the federal government's role in mitigating the impact of climate change? Well, as the only PhD scientist in Congress, this has been an issue uh, with uh, me for a long time. We're in the midst of a global climate crisis, and it's more critical than ever that the federal government take action. But we have to be wise in the action that we take. Uh, first, uh, we, have to, um, we have to decarbonize our economy. 
It's not going to be cheap, um, but we have the money to do it. And what I voted for in the Inflation Reduction Act um, puts our country finally on a credible path towards decarbonization. But secondly, and more important, is we have to continue to invest in the cost-lowering technologies that will allow not only the United States, but the rest of the world uh, to decarbonize their economy. We have enough money to decarbonize ours, but we're only 5% of the, of the population of the world. And we have to develop those technologies. And I'm very proud of the roles that labs like Argonne National Lab have in all developing the technologies that are already deployed. Um, and when we uh, passed the, um, the Inflation Reduction Act, when we passed the Chips and Science Act, there were big hunks of money that were allocated and they are being spent over the next five years. They have to be spent wisely. And I'm proud to be one of the members of Congress who's consulted regularly by the agencies that are trying to understand congressional uh, intent in ways to make sure that money is spent in the ways that does the most decarbonization of our economy. Um, and then I'm also proud that, that you know the people who know me and they know my record on this for more than a decade, and that's why I'm proud that I'm the only candidate in this race endorsed by the Sierra Club. I'm the only candidate in this race endorsed by the League of Conservation Voters. And I'm the only candidate in this race um, endorsed by the NRTC, the National Resources Defense Council. Uh, you know, they understand that to make meaningful progress in this, you have to win elections, get things done, and, uh, and simply demanding things uh, without having the the technical chops to make sure that the, what you're trying to accomplish can actually be done effectively. Um, it's not that productive. Thank you. A question that's frequently asked by um, constituents is, what further legislation would you promote, if any, to reduce gun violence in this country? Candidate Foster, we'll begin with you. Yeah, well, first off, I support Illinois' ban on assault rifles, and I support similar nationwide ban. I co-sponsored the Assault Weapon Ban of 2023, Act of 2023, and have signed a discharge petition to force Speaker Johnson to bring this up for a vote. And I'm very proud of my F rating from the NRA. Weapons of war do not belong in our streets, period. And I'm, I've also been supported several other efforts to address gun violence in our community. I co-sponsored the Bipartisan Background Checks Act, which would just establish universal background checks, and which is the absolute minimum that we should be doing to keep dangerous weapons out of the long hands. Finally, I, I co-sponsored the Lori Jackson Domestic Violence Survivor Protection Act, which finishes the job started by the Bipartisan Safer Communities Act that I was proud to vote for, and closes the boyfriend loophole, assuring that no domestic abusers can legally pur purchase a legal weapon. I also support red flag laws to allow courts to remove guns from dangerous individuals and support ch closing the Charleston loophole uh, affecting background checks, simply requiring and requiring the secure storage of firearms in homes with children and many other policies to keep Americans safer that I'm proud to have supported and voted for. Candidate Rashid, the same question to you. What further legislation would you promote, if any, to reduce gun violence in this country? You know, as somebody who uh, lost somebody very near and dear to me to gun violence, this is a subject that I have thought about and have worked on immensely. And look, we know what the solutions are, and the vast majority of Americans want them. More than 90% of Americans want uh, universal background checks. Uh, a large majority, 70% or more, support red flag laws, closing the boyfriend loophole, um, a, you know, uh, a safe storage uh, regulations. There's a push to hold gun manufacturers accountable. Um, the assault weapons ban, these are all fantastic pieces of legislation. And I commend the work done by groups like Moms Demand and March for Our Lives to get this done. The question that I want people to think about is why aren't these pieces of legislation becoming law? And it fundamentally comes down to the point that I've been making. When we have politicians funded by special interests, they will vote for what the special interests want them to do. That's why it's not enough to simply boast about voting for some, for some bill about getting corporate money out of politics. We need to lead by example, because think of it this way. Let's say I say to you, well, you know, these influences don't affect me, they just affect everyone else you're effectively uh, giving it a double standard because every politician is going to say that. 
You need to lead by example. We need to elect leaders because guess what? The same corporations like Exxon that are paying politicians to promote fracking and, and drilling, similar corporations like the NRA are paying politicians to prevent gun safety legislation. So we know what the solutions are. We've been screaming at them for years and years. And I commend the amazing work of groups like Mom Demand and March for Our Lives for passing some great legislation. But for us to get federal gun safety legislation, we need to elect members of Congress who don't just uh, you know, talk the talk, but they walk the walk. Let's get corporate money the heck out of politics so we know that every single vote our elected public servants are making is to serve the actual public, not some corporate entity. Thank you. Gentlemen, this is our last question. The time has just flown by. And it'll begin with candidate Rashid. What are your what concerns, if any, do you have with our current electoral process and voter access? Well, uh, you know, I, I think voting rights and voting access is one of the fundamental core pillars of a strong democracy. Uh, Republicans have introduced more than 600 pieces of legislation to make voting more difficult. Uh, these voter ID laws, these effective you know, poll taxes that we're seeing today. Um, but but to, to me, I think one of the, the biggest threats are when uh, politicians on both sides of the aisle uh, will give us lip service about democracy, but then engage in behaviors that are anti-democratic. You know, for example, politicians who will vote for the ACA and then take a half million dollars from health insurance companies and then vote repeatedly to strip down the ACA. Uh, politicians will vote for bank reform and then take a half million dollars from the big banks and then vote to deregulate banks. What we need is to ensure that every single vote our public officials make is with the people in mind. You know, one of the things they teach you in law school is that you have to recuse yourself if there's a conflict of interest. And you also have to recuse yourself when there's a perception of a conflict of interest. This is why there's so much outrage over the Supreme Court justices taking these massive donations and pretending that, no, it doesn't affect me. Of course it does. If you believe that a Supreme Court justice taking a $20,000 vacation is going to influence his judgment, then you should know for a fact that a politician taking a $20,000 donation from the corporation is influencing that person's judgment. And you should vote that person out because at the end of the day, our responsibility as our founding documents say is we the people of the United States in order to form a more perfect union. Not we the corporations, not we the special interests. Let's elect people who have a proven history in fighting for marginalized communities, who have a history of fighting for democracy, not just with our words, but with our actions. And that's why I'm excited about this because my campaign, our candidacy is the only candidate in this race focused on, one, on a 100% people funded campaign to protect our democracy with our actions. Candidate Foster. What concerns, if any, do you have with the current electoral process and voter access? Well, as I mentioned previously, some of my proudest votes are uh, to restore all of the, the rights that have been stripped away by the Supreme Court um, towards, uh, towards just fair access to voting. And my record of voting to reform our nation's uh, campaign finance system speaks for itself. That's why I was proud to be just awarded an A grade by End Citizens United for my voting record on this issue. Explicitly, here's the, here's the facts. Last Congress, I co-sponsored and I voted for HR1. This would first mandate nonpartisan redistricting and end gerrymandering, restore Voting Rights Act protections that have been eroded by the Supreme Court, Impro impose stricter limitations on foreign lobbying, requiring super PACs and other dark money organizations to disclose their donors, to set up a system for public financing of our campaigns and enhance ethics rules for federal officials, including federal judges. This I have voted for, I've supported and voted for. And, um, but we also have to recognize um, that uh, many people don't know what it's like to, to defend a tough seat. Um, and in, in the last election, in 2022, Republicans spent three and a half million dollars trying to defeat me. A lot of that corporate money, and they've spent over $20 million during my career, much of it corporate money, attempting to defeat me. And so I'm a strong supporter of getting money out of politics, and that only happens when we can win the seats that are at, at risk in this election. And um, I'm proud that I've been 
part of the team that's been able to do that election after election. Thank you. Well, it's now time for closing statements. Candidates, you will each have two minutes for your closing statement. Candidate Foster, we'll begin with you. Well, uh, thank you to the League of Women Voters for hosting this forum. I'm a scientist and a businessman with a proven record of getting things done for the Illinois 11th District of Congress. So if you're concerned about reproductive freedom, I am the only candidate in this race endorsed by Planned Parenthood. And I stood by Planned Parenthood when the Aurora Planned Parenthood Center was firebombed in 2015. And if you're concerned about gun violence, you need to have a candidate who can actually win tough districts and make a difference in the votes in Congress on this. If you're concerned about the environment, I am the only candidate in this race endorsed by the League of Conservation Voters, by the Sierra Club and the NRDC. And if you're concerned about the future of working families and the fairness of our economy, I am the candidate who, when the Belvedere plant was shut down by a transnational conglomerate, I called up the White House and I worked with them and the, the, the Illinois elected officials and the UAW to get that plant reopened. And I'm the only candidate in this race endorsed by the great majority of organized labor, including the AFL-CIO, the Illinois Federation of Teachers, the Machinists, the Carpenters, and many others. These are organizations that know who fights for the working families of America. So I appreciate your attention and humbly ask for your vote in the coming election. Candidate Rashid, you have two minutes for your closing statement. Thank you to the League of Women Voters of Naperville. Uh, thank you, Bill Foster. And thank you to the hundreds who have tuned in. This is what makes democracy great. And I am privileged and honored to have the chance. A immigrant who is now a U.S. citizen who grew up in Section 8 housing running for U.S. Congress to represent the people that made me who I am, the people that I grew up among. You know, this at once upon a time used to be a deep red seat. Now it's a solid Democrat deep blue seat. And we need to elect somebody who has a vision for the future reflective of the needs of this seat. If you care about abortion access, know that I am the only candidate in this race championing guaranteed universal health care to ensure all people have access to abortion in this country when and how they need it. If you care about climate justice, know that I am the only candidate in this race endorsed by Gen Z for change and global youth climate action. And I'm the only candidate who re rejects Exxon money, who rejects fracking, who rejects offshore drilling, who rejects carbon capture because I follow the science that climate scientists are telling us. If you are worried about corporate money in politics, know that I am the only candidate in this race, 100% funded by the people. I am the only candidate in this race who rejects anti-union money from corporations like Amazon and other big banks and pharmaceutical companies who have a history of exploiting us and denying us our due. And if you care about healthcare, know that I am the only candidate in this race, race not funded by the healthcare companies because I believe healthcare is a human right. And I look at the model established by dozens of nations worldwide of the right to guaranteed universal healthcare. I ask for your vote on March 19th for a new vision of the future. One from a working class kid who worked hard to be successful and wants to open the door to ensure every person has that same access to the American dream that I did. Join our campaign, visit us at costumrashid.com and let's win this election on the tenets of people funding and justice because my friends, justice can't wait. Gentlemen, behalf of the community and myself, I wanna thank you for being with us this evening. You know, our democracy thrives when all of us are engaged. Attending or watching a candidate forum is an excellent way to be empowered to join discussions on local issues and make your voice heard on election day. We hope each and every one of you listening today will vote and inspire your family and friends and neighbors to do the same. Early voting began on February 8th at election authorities and will begin on March 4th at permanent polling places as designated by each county. To vote by mail, please request a ballot from your home county's election division website. Additional information on how and when to vote can be found at 411.vote411.org and the Naperville League of Women Voters website and social media. Recording of this forum for Democratic candidates for the Illinois 11th Congressional District can be found on the Naperville League of Women Voters YouTube channel. Thank you all for watching. Candidates, we wish you the very best on the campaign trail. Good night. Good night.